Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Today, I wanted to talk about uh, zombie fungus and zombie insects and other zombie arthropods, uh, which have appeared in the news today, and it gives me an opportunity to talk about how some of this research is misrepresented. Not that it's bad research, but mostly how it gets misrepresented uh, in public sort of psy pop reporting and uh, kind of talk to you guys a little bit about insect immune systems and insect immunity. But first, please like and subscribe. It helps me out a lot. Today, there was this really cool article that came out about um, a new kind of cordyceps that was discovered in cave spiders in Ireland. And this is kind of the uh, standard story of cordyceps. If you don't know about cordyceps, it is a type of fungal pathogen that tends to infect insects and other arthropods. And it causes uh, what a lot of times gets referred to as a zombifying effect on those hosts in which the uh, insect, or in this case, a spider, will appear to start modifying its behavior in ways which seems to benefit the fungus. And so it gets called zombification because it appears that the host is out of, you know, they're out of control and they're just acting in a way to spread the pathogen. This most often gets reported in ants, but cordyceps is known from a lot of different arthropod hosts. Why this got brought up is apparently BBC were uh, BBC filmmakers reported this uh, when they were filming one of their series. This uh, cave spider was infected, and what this fungus appears to cause the cave spider to do is it evacuates the cave, which it normally would spend its entire life with, in order to go outside where it can, uh, you know, it appears to be able to spread the fungus. And this fungus ended up being named after David Attenborough, who uh, narrates a lot of these series. So this is, I mean, I'm not going to go through this whole article. I will link it, but it's interesting in that it's another kind of cordyceps, but I'm sure that you have seen these cordyceps before uh, and you get these sorts of giant fungal filaments growing out of the host. And the most com this one is a fly that's been absolutely ravaged by this fungus. The most commonly represented in media are ants, in which they will uh, kind of abandon the colony and they will go to a high point. They will fix their mandibles onto uh, some some substrate, uh, at which point they will die, and then these fungal filaments grow out of their head. And this was kind of the basis of the video game The Last of Us. Quite a bit of this gets misrepresented as sort of strange behaviors in insects. And this is where the behavioral sort of immunity, the science of behavioral immunity comes in. So like I said, uh, cordyceps are not particularly rare. It is hard to find them in this sort of fruiting state in nature because they generally only form these fruiting structures under very specific conditions. Um, but the behavior itself is not straight. This, this, uh, this behavior that the fungus causes is not necessarily a new behavior for the insects. What I think is actually happening is the fungus is taking advantage of behaviors that already exist in arthropods, getting itself into such a position, evolved in su into such a position as to benefit from them. If we go into some of the uh, behavioral systems, immune behavioral systems of insects, maybe you'll understand this a little bit. So insects do have immune systems. They do have a, an immune system just like uh, humans have although it operates differently. They don't have antibodies, but they do have their version of white blood cells, just like you do, that go around devouring any sort of infections in their tissues and blood. They do have something in place of antibodies. They do produce uh, molecular toxins or chemical toxins for pathogens, and this is usually in the form of melanin. So like in humans where we uh, will have melanin in our skin or in our hair, which darkens it, uh, insects will produce melanin in order to encapsulate and poison pathogens or parasites within their bloodstream. Uh, and this is very dangerous because melanin is quite toxic. So if it, if an insect is heavily infected and it produces too much melanin, it can kill itself. Uh, it can melanize itself to death. But they also have a number of behavioral activities which they undergo, which helps either destroy bacteria or, in this case, fungi. With insects, the majority of the pathogens are fungi. Uh, as opposed to in humans where we see a lot of viruses and bacteria, those also exist in insects, but the big problem for insects are, are uh, fungal infections. 
but they have a number of things that they can do to avoid these fungal infections. So one is just spatial avoidance. They tend to stay away from places where fungi tend to hang out or where, you, where they're likely to get infected. So this would be uh, stay out of damp, dark places, things like that. Uh, in, in this example, this is from a paper which I will post in the description that goes over all of the uh, most common behavioral immunities of insects. If you want to read it, it's pretty good. Um, it's an older paper, but it's it's very, very helpful. A lot of times they'll lay their eggs in places where fungus or parasites are not likely to find them. Or uh, like with cicadas, there is a temporal avoidance. So one of the things that, or one of the theories about why periodic cicadas only come out every 13 or 17 years is because of an attempt to avoid a certain uh, fungal STD parasite, uh, which has a hard time synchronizing with prime numbers because how do you, it's hard, it's, you can't really predict a prime number emergence like 13 and 17 uh, because it's not divisible by anything else. So you, it's hard to time an emergence of a fungus with those things. So that's uh, something that you can do. Just avoid them in time. If the pathogen is active, you stay inactive. Trophic avoidance is avoiding, just avoid eating things that pathogens might be on, which insects are known to do. Uh, if they see a dead insect, if they see a dead conspecific insect on a leaf, they will avoid eating that leaf because uh, maybe there's something on that leaf that killed them. This is what we saw in the video grooming. So in, in a lot of social insects, but also in a lot of uh, solitary insects, they will groom themselves constantly. This is seen a lot in the wasps, bees, and ants. Uh, or if they're social, they will groom each other in order to avoid these parasites being on them. Uh, and when they detect that they are getting sick, they may groom themselves more heavily. Prophylactic medication is a really interesting one because this is something that we don't really think about, but in honeybees, this is really common, which is you embed your nest or your living quarters with compounds, plant compounds, which are antimicrobial. And bees do this really well. They have this thing called propolis, which they smear all over the inside of their hives. And this is derived from plant resins, usually uh, like tr uh, tree resin, pine tree resin, cedar resin, stuff like that. And they use it as a glue to get everything nice and stable, but they smear it on all of the surfaces. And it's really, really hard to break when you're trying to like harvest honey or anything like that. But the purpose of this is it's really, really good at stopping the spread of pathogens because of the compounds in this resin basically sterilize all the pathogens. So that's really neat. Uh, but other and other non-bee insects do that as well. Insects will also avoid mating with infected partners. They will also especially in social insects, increase social distance uh, if they suspect that there is some sort of infection. And this is what we saw with those ants. Uh, when the colony realized that they had uh, an infected ant in the colony, it was physically removed. Sometimes they're physically killed in order to prevent them from infecting the entire colony. And then sometimes with insects, they will physically remove themselves from the colony. In the case of that ant, it's not just that they might be carried away, but they may wander away and it's not that they're being zombified, it's that this is already an innate immune response in the insect, which would get them to leave the colony behind. Uh, and it does benefit the fungus in one way because it gets them to move to a broader area and disperse spores in a larger area. Even though it would be nice if you disperse spores in the colony, it also benefits them if you go above the colony and disperse spores into the wind. So we've seen grooming in these ants, we've seen decreased social contacts, Sometimes insects will specifically eat things that will uh, increase their immune response to infection. But this is the big one here, behavioral thermoregulation. This is sometimes called behavioral fever. Uh, and this is something very common in arthropods. And it's something that I think explains a lot of the wandering in these zombified insects. Uh, and especially in the spider that apparently seems to leave its cave and go into the sunlight when it's infected. So insects cannot control their body temperature through metabolic means like mammals can. They are cold-blooded and they were, they are at the, at the mercy of their environmental temperatures and they mimic that environmental temperature. One thing that insects will do if they are parasitized or uh, they have some sort of infection is that they will climb a substrate as high as they can get before their death and kind of latch themselves on. This is kind of what you're seeing in this picture. They will latch themselves onto a leaf or a blade of grass, and they will force themselves to bask in direct sunlight, 
or as much sunlight as they can get. So they want to get high. In the jungle, this is really difficult because of dense canopy. But in like grassland, it's really easy because they don't have to go very far. So they try to get into a place that has some direct sunlight, and then they latch on and they bake themselves in the sun. And the goal is to get yourself hot enough that it kills the fungal infection but doesn't kill you. So sometimes this doesn't work, or many times it doesn't work, but it is a behavioral response, in uh, a behavioral immune response in order to kill the pathogen. And this is well known from a lot of different kinds of insects. So it's not like, oh, well, the only social insects developed at the, or, or something like that. This is well known across uh, all of the insect orders and other arthropods as well. So this may be what is occurring when those ants in, climb high and latch onto a substrate. They might be trying to get a little ray of sunlight in the through the jungle canopy. And it could be what is happening with the spiders when they leave the cave in order to get into the sunlight. Now, this isn't necessarily zombification, but it does benefit the fungus. Because if the fungus manages to survive, the insect crawls up, right? Let's say that the fungus survives and the insect dies. Well, the cordyceps grows out of it and then starts raining spores down uh, into the wind, basically. And it and it disperses that way. So it's kind of a, a roll of the dice for the cordyceps. It benefits from this if it is more you know thermotolerant than other sorts of fungi. You again, you have more grooming, um, and then you have fecundity and tolerance compensation. A lot of this is, uh, if you are infected, one of the ways insects get around this is just have more babies than the pathogen can deal with, or um, eating more frequently is another thing where if this pathogen is going to cause you to waste away, then you can just start eating more in order to compensate for this. So a lot of this is just behavioral tolerances. But anyway, that's what I wanted to talk about today. Don't necessarily think that the zombifying fungi are definitely in control of the insect mind. A lot of the times this is a an effect, an evolutionary effect of benefiting from things that are already in place. So this this also occurs in humans with like uh the flava uh, the is the flava viruses, I believe, uh like dengue, where they benefit from uh your own immune system. They can use your own antibodies in order to make you sicker and get into more tissues. So it's not that your body is under the control of a virus, it's that the virus is benefiting from something your body would have already be doing. So I'll talk to you guys later. Uh, thanks for watching.